But Walter Babst was caught during the To Catch a Predator sting of Riverside, California. He was 43 years old at the time and believed that he was talking to a 12 year old female. Over the course of this video, I will review the chat log between Walter and the perverted justice decoy, and then take a look at the confrontation with Chris Hansen at the sting house. The information that is available to us is just a small window into Walter's life, a window that I will be using to speculate on what may have been going on with him at the time of this incident. The commentary that I provide on this situation is intended for entertainment entertainment purposes. It's a way for me to share my perspective on a criminal subject that has interested me for some time now. I hope that this video can spark healthy discussion around a very difficult and uncomfortable subject. Let's jump right in, shall we? Having seen the decoy's underage profile, Walter starts the chat by saying, Beth, you are a real cutie, how are you doing? Then asks her if she has no school this week, or if any of her parents are home. This indicates that he knows he's definitely speaking with a minor, even though age has not been established yet. After learning that her mother leaves her alone sometimes, he compliments her independence, and then jokingly tells her to watch out for guys like him. He knows exactly what he is, a predator, and is using humor to mask the sinister nature of it. He's hiding in plain sight and hoping that the girl will be intrigued enough to play this game with him. Him. By revealing that she should look out for guys like him, this allows him to rationalize the whole situation in his mind. If the conversation were to progress any further, he would at least be able to tell himself that, hey, I've already alerted her to the reality of the situation. It is well documented that when an adult engages in early stages of grooming behavior, they will play many little mental games like this. Small, self-reassuring gestures that allow them to progress internally with their illegal desire. In a confused manner, the decoy responds to Walter's claim that she should be wary of him by saying that she thinks guys like him are nice. This in turn prompts Walter to let her know that he is in fact nice, it's just that he really thinks she is cute, and not in an innocent way. We see him now flipping his comment of him being the naughty one onto her, thus allowing him to transition seamlessly into sexual dialogue, as he has claimed that he thinks she does not look innocent. This would be aimed to allow him to proceed with what he wants to talk about with little to no resistance, as the pressure that it would place on a young girl is subtle yet powerful. If she happens to be the sort of person that avoids conflict, as many young people are, especially with adults, then she could at this point be led to believe that all of Walter's sexual advances are of her own doing, as he's telling her that the image that she has presented to the world is giving men the impression that she wants something that's not so innocent. He's subconsciously telling her that she's essentially bringing this attention upon herself. Walter now asks the decoy for a few more pictures and she sends them through. He reviews them and approves before musing over the thought that she would look great in skirts, as he loves a girl in skirts. I'm going to get this out of the way early because I really can't go through this chat log without making it abundantly clear how I feel about this individual. Each of us who view the To Catch a Predator program would find themselves more repulsed by some of the men over others, for a variety of reasons, possibly an individual individual reminds you of someone that you know in real life, or triggers memories of situations that you've been through yourself. Some of the men, like Chuck Harding, may trigger feelings of hate due to the possible harm he caused over his lifetime to children, or Clifford Wallach for bringing his young son to the sting house with him. Let's get this straight, they're all bad in their own way, but for me, I have a personal added resentment towards Walter due to how important I regard education and the role that teachers play towards the development of not only our children, but our society as a whole. Walter Babst at this point in time was a teacher, working at a high school educating students. For this man to say that he loves a girl in a skirt really sends a chill down my spine as he would be around girls wearing skirts frequently. It's troubling to me that he is operating the tool of education under this horny and broken frame of mind. Children are sent to school to be educated, and in a perfect world we are trusting that the people we leave them with are shining examples of wholesome adults. Mentors who will teach our children not only the curriculum, but how to approach the world as well adjusted as possible. Individuals that our children can look up to and ask questions, have conversations with and all round share a healthy connection as they impart wisdom onto these young impressionable minds. To think that one of these people is walking around the schoolyard, looking at legs and skirts is beyond despicable. How can one trust his judgments? Will he be favouring certain students over others because they wear a shorter skirt? Will he provide more assistance and attention to students who he finds more attractive? Ignoring some others who are crying out for help in regards to their studies and life in general. 
I know the world can be a dark place, and this awful situation likely happens more than I'd care to think about, but here we have it staring at us in all of its blatant awfulness. This man right here has opted to utilize this sensitive learning environment for the pursuit of goals related to his penis. I'm gonna have to move on from this because the more I think about it, the more upset I get. And going down that path, we'll never get to the end of this video, that's for sure. Walter asks if the girl is able to shop for herself, and the decoy says not often as her mother doesn't let her. And when he asks her if she picks her own clothing, the decoy responds by saying sometimes, if her mum allows it. I'll now bring your attention to an excerpt of conversation where Walter begins to display the reason for his presence here. In regards to the decoy not being able to choose her own clothes, Walter says, Love her loud, figures. Lol, bet she says no to all the hot stuff. Yeah, she's a drag. Lol, same goes for panties too, right? Yeah. You want thongs and g-strings? Yeah, guys like them. Love them, especially under short skirts. Yeah, they're cool, lots of girls at my school wear them. I know, laugh out loud. Well, you could always buy a couple pair and keep them secret. Yeah, uh, maybe, when mums leaves. Walter here is revealing to the decoy all of the things that he fantasizes about. He wants young girls to want thongs and g-strings. And this decoy, despite it being one of her first stings, is an expert at what she is doing. She takes note of where Walter's mind is at, and gives him the tools to paint this devious picture as vividly as possible. Walter knows how to read and write pretty well, and has no trouble expressing himself through words like many of the other predators we've seen do. The decoy would also have a similar level of control over the English language, and as she watches Walter begin to explore his twisted thoughts, she holds his hand, allowing him to feel comfortable and supported in expressing these thoughts. Yet she does not take control away from him, allowing him to believe that he is in charge here. If we look a little closer, Walter has presented the idea that he bets her mum says no to buying all of the hot stuff. The decoy takes this cue and confirms that her mother is indeed a drag. Walter pushes it a little further now, exploring where the young girl's mind is at in regards to the topic of clothing. He asks if she likes thongs and g-strings as he cautiously moves towards that sexual danger zone. The decoy masterfully gives him the pass that he's looking for, telling him that she does in fact want thongs as guys like them. This subtly lets Walter know that she has begun to have thoughts about boys and what it is they like. She's just let him know without actually saying it that she's in the early stages of sexual exploration. Walter takes the bait, and like a bull that has just seen red, charges at it. He lets her know that boys don't just like it, they love it. He most certainly loves it, especially when they're worn under skirts. He's letting the girl know that she now has the power to do something that he will find incredibly sexy. A potent and intriguing thought for a young girl who has not yet discovered the power that she may be able to wield over boys and men in this department. Next, the decoy continues the conversation by saying that lots of girls in her school wear them, hinting that she feels as though she's missing out, and that this sexualized attire is already normalized in her mind as her peers wear it. I really do have to commend the decoy here. It may not seem like much at all, but talking to people like this is not an easy task to do. It's a fine line to walk. One would need to put aside the repulsion that they have for these people and their words, and slot themselves into a submissive role, allowing the man to feel as though as they have control over you without scaring them off, or getting them to do something that they otherwise would not do. It is one's duty as a decoy to not engage in entrapment, but it is also their task to identify someone that may be a predator, and gently lure them in, getting them to do something that they would have in fact done anyway, should have they found another young person online to prey upon. Finding the right Right words to do this in this moment would not always be straightforward, and here the decoy has allowed Walter to explore his thoughts of panties and g-strings, whilst conveying that she is possibly ready to explore her own sexuality, all within three short concise lines. Now Walter is ready to go, he has found his prey and he cannot wait to strike. This puts us directly into the next line of dialogue, which revolves around the decoy being home alone. Where is she going? Will it just be you and dad then? Or who? She's going to OR to see some friends and no, my dad's split. So who will you be with? Just me, thank God. Won't have to listen to bitchin'. Wow, for how long? Mum's leaving today like noon and coming back Sunday night. She left me money for pizza and stuff. It's gonna be cool. Oh wow, cool. Yeah. Love out loud. Want some company, lol? You wanna come over? Yep. From the instant he hears that her mum is leaving, he begins sniffing around for details. Where is she going? Will it just be you and dad, or who? So who will you be with? 
You'll be alone? Wow, for how long? Want some company? When the decoy asks him if he would like to come over, there is a 30 second pause in the dialogue before Walter says yep. This is not a man who is considering whether he should or shouldn't do this. Whether the moral implications of his decisions could be considered disgusting and dangerous. It took him only 30 seconds to agree to meeting up with a 12 year old who's going to be home alone. It's also interesting to observe that despite his strong grip of the written English language, he still chooses to spell the word come in reference to coming over as C-U-M. I wonder if he spells it that way up on the whiteboard when teaching his students during class, eh? Hey? That'd probably raise an eyebrow or two. The decoy asks him why he would like to come over, and Walter responds without hesitation, saying that he'd love to get her naked and then they would have sex. The decoy remarks that she's never done that before, and expresses concerns that she might not be any good at it. Walter reassures her, and in true predator fashion lets her know that he would totally enjoy it. The dialogue continues with Walter inquiring about her period. Yeah. Have you had period yet? Yeah, started last year. Oh, why? I come a lot, and it is potent. Oh, that could, like, make me preggers, right? Yes. Oh, would prefer not to use condom and pull out, but risky, because you are so hot. I'm not sure I would be able to get it out without shooting some in you. That whole excerpt is pretty disturbing, isn't it? I highlighted it to showcase the moment that Walter decides to dive penis first into sexual dialogue. The disturbing sad face that Walter sends when he learns that her body has begun the cycle of menstruation. The revelation that his sperm is potent, leading me to believe that he either has a lot of children or has irresponsibly gotten a lot of people pregnant. And finally, the foul inner conflict on display as he does not wish to use a condom, but thinks it would be difficult to remove himself in time due to how attractive he finds her. There's no mucking around with this man, he's not talking to her about what she wanted her first time to be like. He's not asking her questions about any concerns she may have. He hasn't even given her his name yet. The facts of this situation are that this kinky man in Corona is going to come around with his potent sperm to have sex with her, and that he has not hesitated in the slightest to allow his fantasy to transition into a reality. As we move down the page, he lets her know that he is a teacher. They chat for a little about what school he teaches at, and he lets her know that if she she went to his school, they wouldn't be able to meet up, as he doesn't meet with students like this. A predator with a code, hey? He won't mess up the lives of any of his own young students, but students from another school is a free-for-all. He begins to lay demands for her to give him her address, and then he exclaims that his penis is hard. The decoy asks, That's cool, why are you hard? Thinking about having sex with you? I'm blushing. What are you wearing at the moment? My boxes and tank I sleep in? I look kinda messy, ain't brush my hair. Yeah. Panties on under the boxes? Yeah. What are they like? Pink with puffy yummy yummy on them. Laugh out loud. Not sure who that is, but okay. It's a cartoon. Okay. I like them. They're cute. Laugh out loud. Cool. I would like you out of them. I want to point out something here that really bothers me about these predator conversations. The predators are so very focused on the one and only topic that interests them, that they ignore any and all signs from the decoy that she or he could be a three-dimensional character. A human being, not just some sex-focused droid. The decoy has expressed interest in a cartoon that Walter has never heard of. This could be a moment that makes him look at the situation and say, oh wow, I'm out of touch with what this young girl is interested in, and at the very least could be a moment where I ask her for information on what her interests are. Instead, Walter uses it as a foul mechanism to further spray diarrhea from his mind all over the chat log. He ignores any signs of depth that this young girl's life may have, and says, I know that you've just expressed interest in this cartoon that's on your clothing, but I would much prefer you get out of that clothing. He is essentially moving the conversation back in a direction that he would like it to go in as quickly and bluntly as possible. Also, I would not be surprised if he's trying to cover up the fact that he knows nothing of what interests this young girl, to hide how out of touch he may be with this young person before she recognizes it. The two go on to discuss condoms, and Walter tries to forcefully get the decoy to agree to sex without using one. The conversation then moves over to what he would like her to wear when they meet up. So you say you have a plaid skirt? Yep, it's so cute. How short? Like half to the knee. Halfway? That's okay. And what top do you have to go with it? I usually wear a white shirt with it, like button up. Does it get tucked in, or is it short enough that it doesn't? Short enough. And shoes? I usually wear black and white shoes with it. Nice. Knee highs? Sometimes pantyhose, sometimes knee socks. No, I don't like pantyhose. Okay, you want me to wear socks? 
Yes. Cool. So that's the list of what you wear? That's it totally? Yeah, I guess. You want me to wear something else? No, that will work nicely. But nothing more than exactly what is on the list. Oh, okay. Nothing more. I know. So no panties or bra. Okay. If that's what you like. I love it. My opinion on what is happening here would be that as Walter teaches young girls, he has fantasized over and over what a sexual meetup with one of them would be like. Now that it is finally within his grasp, he needs it to go exactly how he wants it to go. This may or may not be his first time meeting up with a young girl, but either way, he is acutely aware that engaging in this would be very illegal. Instead of that acting as a deterrent, it appears instead he doesn't want to waste the moment, so to speak. He can't have the decoy wearing whatever the hell she wants, as this may be his one and only chance to sleep with a minor. He quizzes her about her wardrobe, and once his options are laid out on the table, he makes a selection for his lovely date. The way this has unfolded reminds me of someone shopping for a car or something. That excerpt of dialogue that I just read out, let's change it around a little and you'll see what I mean by the car dealership thing. So, you say you have a convertible model? Yup. How many doors? Two doors. That's okay. And what tops do you have to go with it? A white button up one. Does it just button up? Is that enough to hold it when we drive? It's enough. What sort of mats come with the vehicle? Black and white ones. Nice. Leather seats? Usually they come with nylon. No, I don't like nylon. Okay, you want me to order leather? Yes. Cool. So that's the list of all your extras? That's it totally? Yeah, I guess. You looking for something else? No, that'll work nicely. Give me exactly what we have discussed. Nothing more. No subwoofers and no rims. Okay, if that's what you like. I love it. I know that's a pretty odd purchase for a vehicle, but you get the drift. This line of dialogue is so very transactional. He's not talking to a child. He's ordering an experience. Is this what he thinks children are? Sexual candy stores where if you enter at the right time, you get a free selection to everything on the shelf? What business does this man have educating children? We move forward through the chat and a brief discussion is had about a phone call. Then Walter decides to send the decoy a picture of his genitals. He compares the girth of it to the size of a can of coke and lets the decoy know that this will hurt going in, but he will be gentle. More conversation of that phone call is had, and Walter says that it's too risky to call, as he could get into a lot of trouble. The decoy, showing her age, innocently asks why would he get in trouble, to which Walter responds, married and teacher. At this point, I don't know what is worse. The fact that he teaches children, or the fact that his wife possibly doesn't know who she's married to. More predator chatter up ahead as they try to organize a time and date for the meetup, and Walter asks the young girl if she is ready to lose her virginity. He confirms that he will be bringing the child some hard alcoholic lemonade, and then it gets really graphic. So warnings up ahead, turn that volume down if you're around people. You will get to watch as the bare head parts your pussy lips. It's so hot. Sounds so cool. Yes. And you can see your wetness on the skin of my... It's awesome. I just hope I'll be good enough. You will be. I know. And wait till you see my whole bear disappear into you. Be my first time to see that. And feel it. So good. Skin to skin. Oh, that's why you didn't want the condoms. Yes. Not even gonna get any. I will pull out and shoot my cum all over your belly and pussy lips. Ooh, okay, that's good. I want you to taste it too. How does it taste? Laugh out loud. I taste mine all the time. Kinda reminds me of uncooked pancake batter. Not great, but not terrible. You taste yours all the time, do you, Walter? <laughs> I've read some pretty weird things in these chat logs, but this one's up there. What could be the possible reason for him needing to taste it all the time? That's on par with Cody Green telling the decoy that he used his mother's vibrator on his own backside. If I am to be critical about it though, I would say that it's all in an attempt to get the child to feel comfortable with doing something that he wants her to do. He's saying that, hey, I eat it all the time, in an attempt to encourage her to give it a go as well. We see a bit of backpedaling going on as he tells her that he doesn't really like the taste, but he does just like licking it out of a girl's genitals after he finishes his business there. A few more lines of predator chatter, and Walter lies about his name, saying that he is John. The two then finally jump on that phone call. After the call, Walter would like to let her know that she sounds great. He's thoroughly happy with the item that he's ordered, and nothing much more worthy of note happens until a little further down. Walter links the decoy a profile of another young girl. He's curious as 
to whether the decoy knows her, as it looks like she goes to the same school. And as it turns out, this is actually another perverted justice decoy. It would seem that Walter is thoroughly prowling this online forum for any young girl he can find. This isn't the first time in the chat that this has happened either. I was waiting till now to highlight it, but earlier on he did find another profile to show the decoy and he says, You there? Laugh out loud. I went back online and found what must be your neighbor, laugh out loud, a little cutie like you. 13 though. I really want to point out that he says 13 though, which implies to me that he does know the age of this decoy despite that information not being present until much later in the chat log. Possibly when they spoke on the phone she told him that she's 12, or that information could be visible on her profile. The rest of the chat plays out with little to no event. They have organized that he will come over the next day and that the decoy has a friend staying over tonight. He's nervous that her friend might return the next day knowing that she's home alone, and the decoy reassures him that her friend will not come back. In true predatory fashion though, Walter does end the log with a bang. Hmm, I am dripping pre-cum already. What's that? Well, when excited and erect, cock starts to ooze pre-cum. Clear liquid, slippery, helps me slide in better. But I tell you, I am so excited by you. We will have to do it a few times. First time, I probably won't last very long at all. That would be cool. If it feels good, I'll want to a couple times. It will. May hurt a little first time, but after that it's awesome. Walter then goes on to educate her about why this may hurt. Hymen. What's that? I laugh out loud, not sure myself, but it's in you. And I will probably bust through it. Some girls don't have one, or it tears naturally. It's natural. Lol. It's what they mean by taking cherry or virginity. Ew, sounds a little gross. Yes, that is. Laugh out loud, but it's special too. We'll be gentle. When I feel it, I will kiss you and then push through. Oh man, <laughs> that one was a bit hard to read. <laughs> So, Walt makes his way over to the sting house where Chris Hansen lies in wait. Unfortunately for Walter though, Hansen will not be so gentle as he pushes a few through of his own. Hey, how are you? Pretty good. Why don't you have a seat right over there, please? I'm under arrest. No, I want to talk to you. Go ahead, have a seat. What's your name? John. John what? I knew it. Go ahead and bust. You knew what? No, just sit. Sit down. John, what's your last name? Hunter. Hunter. And how old are you now? 43. 42. And what are you doing here? Getting my ass kicked. Getting your ass kicked? Yeah. I knew it. I knew I should. I knew it was a setup. I, no, I need you to sit down, please. I need you to just arrest me and take me to jail and, and execute. I need to talk to you first. Because I, I, you know what? I didn't. I didn't bring anything. I didn't want to do anything. Whatever. Well, why did you come here, though? Help me to understand. Because I'm a sick son of a bitch. Let's take it back a bit there and have a look at Walter's opening line. Hey, how are you? Pretty good. Why don't you have a seat right over there, please? I'm under arrest. His very first reaction is, I'm under arrest. And the way that he delivers it so casually leads me to suspect that in some way he was anticipating this outcome. For some of the more paranoid predators, walking through the door would be a clutch moment, a transition from fantasy to reality, and the point of no return. It would be a heart-thumping few seconds where they contemplate all the possible scenarios. For someone like Walter, who is not lacking in the intellect department, I would not be surprised that he's thought this could be a possible police thing handful of times. To take the risk and go ahead with entering the house, and now to be confronted by a figure as calm and commanding as Hansen, all of his fears have manifested in front of him, and he asks if he is under arrest, to somewhat soften the blow should he actually be in legal troubles. No, I want to talk to you. Go ahead, have a seat. What's your name? John. John what? I knew it. Go ahead and bust. You knew what? No, just sit. Sit down. John, what's your last name? Hunter. Hunter. It's interesting that he provides a false name here, John Hunter. Despite his logic alerting him that this is a possible police operation, he still has his survival instincts taking point as he provides the false name. And for what reason, I can only speculate. I am of the opinion that Walter may be operating under the hope that this man is actually not law enforcement. That his declaration of him knowing that this is a police sting is more of a manipulative maneuver rather than an honest outburst of raw inner dialogue. If he did truly think that this was law enforcement, 
It's a pretty silly move to provide a false name. And how old are you now? 43. 42. And what are you doing here? Getting my ass kicked. Getting your ass kicked? Yeah. I knew it. I knew, I sh I knew it was a setup. I, no, I need you to sit down. Bitch. I need you to just arrest me, take me to jail, and, and execute I me. need to talk to you first. I need you to take me to jail and execute me is a rather abrupt and dramatic statement to make with the tone that he delivers it in. Hansen hasn't accused him of anything yet, and Walter has gone all in on his roundabout style of guilt admission. As I just mentioned, I do think that this is just a technique to wiggle his way out of the fire. Yet if we are to take what he is saying seriously, it does lead to a few interesting questions. Is he making this statement because he is saying that he has been living with these demons for years, that his urges finally got the better of him and he made a massive mistake, acknowledging now that he is a blight on humanity and that his execution would make the world a better place? Or is he saying that his life is over now? That everything he has spent his existence building, his career and marriage and family, it's all over now, so he might as well die. There is no recovery from this that he is aware of, so you might as well execute him. Because I, I, you know what, I didn't, I didn't bring anything, I didn't want to do anything. Whatever. He's just told Hansen that he should be executed, which is a pretty hefty declaration of guilt. Then his brain quickly slams on the brakes and says, Whoa, 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 slow down there, Walter. I know you're trying to get us out of trouble here, but no need to be so dramatic. We may survive this one yet. Let me take over for a second so I can give the man a lie. Uh, I, you know what? I didn't, I didn't bring anything. I didn't want to do anything. And about halfway through the god-awful attempt at deception, he realizes how ridiculous this attempt is. <sighs> Whatever. This teacher must really be used to arguing with children, as the old whatever technique is a pretty childish one, hey? Well, why did you come here, though? Help me to understand. Because I'm a sick son of a bitch. Kudos to that self-awareness. I've never done it before. I, t I talk about it online all the time. Well, well help me to understand. What, what, I mean, do you have a, con a compulsion? An addiction to the internet? I've never done anything with anybody except my wife. Ever. Now, who, who are you here to see? I don't even know. And you know what? I'm gonna ask you something. Am I under arrest? You're not right now, no. But I need to ask you some more questions first. Yeah. Now, you were here, no, 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 no. I want you to sit down, please. I need, I need to go. Can I go? I wanna talk to you a little bit more first. Please just sit down. Would you like some water? No, I, I, I just, I'm about to puke. If one is able to grasp the severity of their situation like Walter here seems to, the level of physical discomfort that would come with this amount of pressure would be next to unbearable. Watch Walter's body movements as he tries to manage this discomfort. Well, well help me to understand. What, what, I mean, do you have a, can, a compulsion? As people are thrust into uncomfortable situations and aren't in any immediate physical threat, it is quite common to see strange movements like this. It seems to be the body's attempt to find some form of relatable and comfortable movement to soothe them through this difficult moment. Watch as he puts his head down to get into an almost resting position in an attempt to hide away from what's currently happening. He then quickly snaps back up as he realizes that this position is not going to help his situation or soothe his discomfort at all. An addiction to the internet? I've never done anything with anybody except my wife. Ever. The way he's just told Hansen that he's never done anything with anyone except his wife has a hint of anger and aggression to it. I've never done anything with anybody except my wife. Ever. If we take a moment to think about the interview so far, and remove from our knowledge that Hansen has read the transcript, Chris has not said one thing that resembles any sort of accusation. There has been no mention of a young child, a crime, or even an indication that he knows why Walter is here. All Hansen has asked for is Walter to sit, stay seated, what is his name and why is he here. In response, Walter is forcefully giving Chris answers to questions that he never asked. The aggressive tone of this specific statement would indicate to me that Walter is intensely frustrated with himself. And if the emotion here is not an act, if he has only been with his wife sexually, it appears that this could be a point of frustration in his everyday life. It's as though he is saying, 
Don't you understand how strong I am as a man? I've only ever been with my wife, but each and every day I go to that school and teach these young girls who wear skirts and knee-high socks. Don't you understand how much of a saint I am, sir? I've only ever been with my wife, and it's nothing short of a miracle that I can contain myself around such temptation. Feel sorry for me. Feel my pain. He's emphasizing this line to really drive the point home to Chris that he is a strong victim here. He is the one who is suffering stoically. Now, who, who are you here to see? I don't even know. And you know what? I'm going to ask you something. Am I under arrest? You're not right now, no. But I need to ask you some more questions first. Yeah. Now, you were here... No, 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 no. I want you to sit down, please. I need, I need to go. Can I go? I want to talk to you a little bit more first. Please just sit down. Would you like some water? I'd like to praise Hansen here, as his ability to read the situation is fairly impressive. Walter is a visible mess, and the panicky energy emanating from here is unmistakable. He's rapidly going through stages of grief and exhibiting some pretty heavy signs of distress. Hansen acknowledges this and keeps his tone soft and gentle. It could even be said that he is acting friendly, all while still commanding the situation and keeping this predator in the room and talking. Now you were here, no, 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 I want you to sit down, please. I need, I need to go. Can I go? I want to talk to you a little bit more first. Please just sit down. Would you like some water? No, I, I, I just, I'm about to puke. No, just... You were talking to a girl named Beth. Yeah, I think so. I don't know. Okay. You know what? I don't know. You, you and know you know how old? That chair squeak gave me a hell of a Friday. No. What did her profile say, John? Her profile said I'm, I'm in trouble. The profile said she was how old? She said 12 or 13. 12 or 13. So you know you were coming here for a 12 or 13 year old girl? No, I know. I, the profile said 12 or 13. I, my profile says 39. People, you, you put it on there, it's kind of a fantasy thing. Okay? I, I, I'm totally, I'm totally screwed. I know that. But it, it's, forget it. What are you doing here on a Saturday morning, coming into a house where you believe a 12 or 13 year old kid is home alone with no parents here? Do you have kids? Yeah, I do. Well, how would you feel if some guy I would in his feel, I, 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 into your house trying to hook up with your kids? I feel pissed. What do you do for a living? I'm in education. You're in education? Yeah. A teacher? Mm -hmm. What grade do you teach? High school. High school. Yes. And you talk about this in your chat. Please, please, just sit down. I, I won't go anywhere. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to go to jail. But I need you just to stay by the bench there, please. What are you wearing at the moment? My boxers and tank top I sleep in. I don't, please don't read it. I know what it says. There's a few things of interest that just transpired that I'd like to go and take a look at. The profile said she was how old? She said 12 or 13. 12 or 13. So you know you were coming here for a 12 or 13 year old girl? No, I don't. I, the profile said 12 or 13. I, my profile says 39. People, you, you put it on there, it's kind of a fantasy thing. A 43-year-old role-playing as a 39-year-old? That's a very specific fantasy thing. Okay. I, I, I'm totally... I'm totally screwed, I know that. There's quite the battle that we're watching play out in Walter's mind as he shifts between utter defeat and mild attempts at deception. He acknowledges the trouble that he is in, yet still throws up these weak little attempts to avoid this said trouble. Saying that chat rooms are all fantasy and he didn't believe the girl was actually young is counterproductive to following that up with, I'm totally screwed. It's as though he hasn't yet settled on how he actually feels about the whole thing. Did he think it was a fantasy or does he think he's screwed? If he thinks he's screwed, then why bring up the fantasy? And if he thought it to be fantasy, why say you're screwed? Then, after acknowledging that he's totally screwed, he begins to dig deep for an excuse. But it, it's... In his mind, he's searching under every rock, opening every door, looking for that good excuse that has got to be around here somewhere. Upon not finding one, he deflates, which in itself is a form of defense. His body language and tone of voice is telling Chris, you wouldn't understand even if I told you the whole story. It's subtly implying that he does in fact have a valid reason to be here, but for whatever it may be, right now he can't enlighten Chris to that fact. A ploy often utilized by intelligent manipulators when they are backed into a corner. The old, you're not really smart enough to understand why I'm actually here. But it, it's... Forget it. What are you doing here on a Saturday morning, coming into a house where you believe a 12 or 13 year old kid is home alone with no parents here? Do you have kids? Yeah, I do. Well, how would you feel if some guy 
I would do, I would walk into your house trying to hook up with your kids. I feel pissed. What do you do for a living? A stinging question. Watch as Walter tosses up whether to tell the truth or not. I'm in education. You're in education. Yeah. A teacher. Mm -hmm. What grade do you teach? High school. Once again, he laces his answer with a shimmer of aggression. His frustration is probably aimed at himself, and the tone of his answer would be an attempt to cut this line of questioning short. I do find it interesting that he would lie about his name, yet give an accurate answer to what his career is. High school. Yes. And you talk about this in your channel. Please, please, just sit down. I, I won't go anywhere. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to go to jail. But I need you just to... Stay by the bench there, please. What are you wearing at the moment? My boxers and tank top I sleep in. I don't, please don't read it. I know what it says. He wasn't expecting this refined, classy looking gentleman to bust out a few lines of the old log hay. And then you sent this, John. Is that appropriate in any way? You know, that's against the law right there. Is it? To transmit that to somebody who you think is underage? Yes, it I is. Transmit it, though. This. No, I didn't transmit that to her. You did not. And so the actor has arrived with an Emmy grade performance here. Watch as he moves the angle of the picture back and forth in an attempt to convey confusion as he tries to gain clarity as to what it is he is looking at. It's a penis, Walter. It's your penis. No, that's on, I think it's online. It's under an adult profile. You didn't transmit this. Not that I, no, honestly, I don't think that I did. Please just keep your hands out of your pockets. There's nothing in there. May I ask who Do you, you see are? my pick in the chat window? Yeah. Yeah, but you think you would like that in you? How big is it? Well, you saw. Go get a can of Coke. Dang, will it hurt? A little yes at first. Now, what, am I, what conclusion am I supposed to draw here, John? I can't see anything. I'm done. I'm fried. Well, there's, please arrest me. There's, there's, just, there's one thing you got to know first. Is that I'm Chris Hansen with Dayline NBC, and we're doing a story on computer predators. Now, if there's anything else you'd like to say... To explain yourself, we'd like to hear it. If not, obviously, you're, you're free to go. And there he goes. The headless phantom makes a break for the exit. And so that's Walter Babst, hey? I've had a lot of trouble making this video without letting my personal feelings of discomfort get in the way, and I've done my best to keep a level head, conveying my perspective without it turning into a roast video. Many times throughout the making of this one, I would have to take a step back and look at my words, only to realize all I was saying were juvenile criticisms. So I took a moment to look at this and ask myself, why may this be happening? When I was in high school, I had three teachers who left a great and positive impression on me. Throughout school, I had much trouble contacting concentrating and learning, and was often the cause of class disruptions and the bearer of after-school detentions. If it weren't for these three teachers that saw something within me, who took that extra effort to guide me towards a place of focus and motivation, I don't know where I may have ended up in my life. I respect them all greatly for that guidance, and even though I have never spoken with them outside of school hours, I've never told them how they helped me. I still do consider them friends to this day. I can't even begin to fathom the damage it could have caused me if one of them had used the trust formed between us for sexual purposes. I'm certain what I'm about to say will draw some criticism. A lot of men that I've spoken with, as young teens, would have welcomed a sexual experience with an older woman that they were attracted to. But I would argue that despite the consent, that older person is taking something from him that he can never get back, causing irreversible damage. For example, if I had begun to engage in sex with one of these trusted teachers, I may have become more focused on doing that over other things. I may have become less interested in developing my social circles, studying, playing sports and having innocent fun overall. All of these things that I heavily equate to being formative elements of who I am today. Who knows how I would have turned out? Possibly I may have been a very different person. I may have even gone on to become someone that I still like very much. But my argument is that I want to be able to make that choice myself. When I look back on my life, I don't want to say, oh, my whole life shifted course because this adult thought that I was cute. Even if my life did turn out okay under those circumstances, the thought that 
that it was altered by an adult's sexual desire is a really uncomfortable one. I am of the opinion that minors should not be engaging or fooling around with sexual thoughts brought on by adult input. It is not fair for an adult to push this onto a minor's life, no matter how consenting that young person may be, whether male or female. Adults should just leave children alone to develop and explore at their own pace. And teachers out of everyone should know this. Let kids be kids for goodness sake. Teachers hold such immense power as they are placed so close to children on a daily basis and into a role that automatically establishes trust. This is the very reason why I hold such deep resentment for Walter at this point in his life. He came into the chat red hot. There was no stopping him. He had his sights set on a sexual experience with a minor from the get-go. He utilized his grasp of the English language to prop himself into a position that should have he been talking to a real child would have really given him an edge to control the situation. This man's intellect, working in sync with his predatory desires, is a very, very dangerous mix. And I could not be more pleased that this program got this man away from children before he caused some serious damage to someone. After the sting, Walter would make bail that weekend and return to work at his school the very next Monday. It was six days until his school discovered the arrest and dismissed him from his position teaching. Walter was charged with attempted lewd acts against a minor and transmission of obscene material to a minor and then served a year in prison. He would change career in the years following his arrest and become an aerospace engineer, helping to design planes. And he now builds detailed models of World War II airplanes and tanks as a hobby. He's actually really quite good at it. There has been no future arrests or criminal charges laid against him since his time on the Dateline program.